it is our last uh, day of uh, rain retreat so i may have to go for a, a, a monk procedure which is called uh, oh. admonishment yeah. <laughs> so, my God. Matasa Bagawato, Arahato, Sama, Sambu, Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. We pay homage to him and to the teaching. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. So I'm really happy to be here. Literally, that has a new meaning. <laughs> you know, each time I say I'm really happy to be here, it turns out to be a new kind of meaning. And um, I had, a, a, I hope this one is recorded, okay? Uh, this this one yes, exactly. uh, kind of an open talk because I, had planned this a, couple, a few weeks ago before I went into the emergency room. Also, it's not exactly what I was, uh, wanted to do, but I actually am watching very carefully this whole experience of having to go through the cancer and to uh, realize what I'm facing and if facing it so suddenly. and. In the last uh, in the last couple last week has been a very very uh, educational thing for me. It has been a very wake up call about several things, and so uh, I've been doing the best I can with everything, and uh, it's been a lot to do about learning about survival initially. But in the beginning, in the beginning of this, we go back to May when I first got here and when uh you know uh discovering stumbling into what was really happening and uh and, and then having to realize okay this is desperate this is actually a very serious level of cancer that we're dealing with and and uh it's unfortunate that we discovered it in a stage four instead of the beginning the second or the third stage which makes it different. Now, in, in what's interesting is I worked with cancer. When I say that to you, I was trained as a cancer registrar by a very famous doctor, Crow. He's de deceased now. And he um, was the head of the radiology department of a hospital in Northampton, Massachusetts. And this was 52 years ago <laughs> that I was got, I stumbled into a position. And you wonder why do things happen to us across our lives? How, how is in life, how is this stuff actually woven together? Is there a path? Is there something, some way that our experience is, uh, as we go across through our life, is it actually hooked together at all? You know, and this has to do with learning about karma and learning about the effects of past lives trickling through into this life and your habitual tendencies. For instance, you have heard me talk to you before about being afraid and what happened with Bonte teaching me about why all of a sudden was I afraid of something when I was 51 and then going back and doing past life work and finding out that there were other lifetimes and it didn't matter if I believed that they were me or not but I stumbled onto four or five other lifetimes where the woman at 51 or 52 years old fell down and died. So one of them fell off a wall, one of them fell off the roof of a house, one of them fell off the um, a cliff, one of them fell into a ravine in a pasture, and one of them fell off a ship, off a amassed onto the deck and died. So what did that have to do with me? I, I don't know, except that in running backwards and watching this uh, experience, somehow there was a connection. 
And somehow this connection uh, wasn't anything to do with this life. This is what came out of working that way. I discovered that this fear that suddenly happened, and you must understand as a child, I was climbing trees that were 50 and 60 feet high. And I could build tree houses and tree stands and do all kinds of things uh, growing up that my father taught me. And, you know, why would I all of a sudden, I cannot stand up on the roof and clean something off the roof and uh, get down. All of a sudden I can't, my legs are frozen. So just remembering that this happened lots of other times in lots of other lifetimes means that this fear really doesn't have anything to do with this lifetime. It's just something that's passing through me from someplace else, it's an energy. I don't have to dissect this. I don't have to scientifically explain this to you. But as soon as I understood this was an imperfection of mind, bingo, all of a sudden, I understood it was an imperfection of mind. And it didn't have anything to do with this lifetime. And the moment that happened, I could climb back up on the roof and clean the roof off. In just a second, I want to get the book here. Oh, I have, I have two books. They're floating around and I didn't expect. But if you go back to Upak Kalesa Sutta, I didn't think this was so valuable for a long time. I didn't think this was so valuable, but it's a very valuable statement to remember, to put in your head and remember. The last, the last paragraph in 128 is the end of the Upak Kalesa Sutta. And the Sutta, it was about all the different 11, I think it was 11 different hindrances. And the Buddha was telling Ananda, he was telling him how he handled his hindrances when he was practicing in meditation. And the last paragraph in summary of 128 tells you a statement and if you remember that statement you can always reflect on it in your life and it said thereupon it's Anuruddha he was telling Anuruddha I developed um it says we meant thereupon I understood the doubt is an imperfection of my mind. So suddenly he's looking at what the Buddha did each time he had a hindrance to handle. He abandoned it. That's a total instruction. He's not examine it. Don't sit with it. Don't wait till it passes away. Don't pretend that you're learning about Anicca. You know, all things change. Don't do that. The moment that you realize you're not doing what you were doing for your task and you were pulled away, the moment that you pulled away, abandon whatever it is because it has nothing for you he kept telling him all 11 of these he said i understood doubt was an imperfection i understood inattention was an imperfection i understood sloth and torpor i understood fear i understood elation i understood inertia i understood excess of energy i understood deficiency of energy i understood an abandoned longing i understood perception of diversity these are these 11 things that bother you, 11 different things. And so what did he have, 11 different solutions? No, he told them, abandon them. They're nothing. They're just your mind throwing something up to keep you from doing what you were going to do, whether you're doing anything in life. And so let it go. That's why the whole entire teaching that we're giving you, moving towards emptiness and abandonment of anything in your mind. And what happens to the mind, to the brain, if you abandon any tension, any tightness, any concern, any thinking is turned off? What can happen? 
you can have what's called a brain wipe. <laughs> you can have suddenly turn off and turn on again. And when you turn on again, what has changed? You have the factory reset on your computer. You just rebooted it. You just restarted it. It comes back to the factory reset and everything operates better. You can see sharper, hear sharper, smell so sharper, taste clearer, touch and sensations are accentuated. Everything is, how does that happen? Because certain chemicals are being released by the brain step by step by step, not just dopamine, dopamine, oxytocins, and there's about four or five others that are all affecting this. And what's happening is clarity, clearness of mind. Okay, so here I sit and I look at this and I say, so all I have to do to change how it works for me and things bothering me is just to play a game of never mind this, whatever came up, never mind it, let go, relax, smile, come back. There you go, that's it. Let go, relax, smile, come back. It's five steps. It's not really six because, come on, sixth one says repeat, right? <laughs> That's not really, obviously, if I want you to change your brain, to change your mind, how it's working, I'm going to show you how to repeat it again and again and how to, to um, uh, what's the word? It's, it's repeat it exactly the same way again and again and again, because that's how we teach the brain to change its neural pathways. And this is the neuroplasticity, okay? The neuroplasticity research has been done. It's 12 or 15 years old. We should congratulate ourselves now because finally 10 or 15 years after this research came out, they're gonna let the normal person like you and me see what this said. And the sum total of what it told you with neuroplasticity research and behavior patterns, what is the sum total of what you learned? All you have to do is stop doing this and start doing this again and again and again and again and again until your mind goes, there you go, I'm gonna behave that way from now on. Let go, relax, smile, come back. Okay, so I'm gonna be going back and forth with a few things in this uh, talk today. But one of the things I was saying to you the last few weeks is what am I learning? How could I be still learning? How could I be feeling like I do now with you? I think I'm lighter and sharper and happier. And I'm, how could I be uh, wanting to teach you and share with you what's happening so much right now? How could I be like that? I was wondering about that too. <laughs> I, every, every month, here's how it works. The first three months for me were hell, total hell. And the reason that it was total hell is because here you are, you definitely have cancer. We definitely can't cure it. We, it's a stage four that has metastasized. It's spread through the bones. It's through the, uh, through the, through the, the this cancer is like a little child who was told you don't have to eat your vegetables. You can eat whatever you want. And this cancer only wants to eat bone. It only wants to eat bone and it wants to eat my ribs. So it's sort of like somebody who's only going to have barbecued um, ribs, <laughs> you know? So it, it, ate, it ate part of my ribs, it ate two of my ribs are broken completely and another one ready to break off kind of, but it's sort of, trying to decide whether it's gonna get stronger or whether it's going to get weaker. So that's the situation and it hurts. It's really, really painful with, with the rib thing. But now, okay, the, the, the first three months, no one was telling me anything clear because they couldn't, it's not their fault. They were doing a very good job. I had two, um, two really good women who are the, um, the, my oncologists, and I have 
two people involved with radiology that I can refer to and talk to. I have another person, a doctor specialist who's in drugs and stuff who can help me to direct me where to get the information or can explain to me what each of the drugs do so that I can manage, uh, manage how to the pain. So my whole life right now, and this becomes a reality for a stage four, the whole life revolves around pain management. Can you keep, can you manage the pain so that the pain is not making it so you can't think, making it so you can't operate? You lose ability to work with your body, lose your muscular, things can happen like that, but I'm very lucky. I'm very, very lucky here. I have strong arms. I have strong legs. I am mobile. I can move around and walk, okay? I can push myself around on a bed enough that, you know, if I need to change position, I can do that without help. So there's a lot of things I can still do. One of the things is to look at what you can do and not what you can't do. <laughs> and that's something we learn in, in, in our athletics. That's something we should be teaching our children. That's something we should be telling everybody, you know, one of the things, one of my favorite coaches in life always told me, you never, there is no such thing as a failure. You fell down and you didn't finish the race, but you tell me what you learned. He would sit down right there on the track and he'd say, okay, so tell me what you learned. You know, I've, I've been in a, a remarkable life that I don't talk about, you know, the experiences and opportunities that I've had in, in growing up in, uh, you know, over the years when I was younger, I had tremendously, you know, opportunities. I didn't have the steering I wish I had from parents that were, were uh, supporting types of parents that were there giving me some sort of things, but I had remarkable opportunities to grab a hold of things and to discover the world. This is what we all should do. We should all be discovering every part of the world. And part of that world we're gonna talk about in the next few weeks, I wanna talk about this and I wanna record it. And I, I'm hoping we can, we can preserve this, you know, because it's important. Everybody has a light inside of them. You can see it in a baby when it's born. You can watch this little light come on and your children, and you watch, you watch the children, you know, this light during your lifetime will shine depending on whether you open the window or not. But you have to raise the shade and you have to let the light in. And we don't always learn how to do this. And we're not always in the best positions in our families, or we're not always in a rich environment. We can be rich or poor. There is no such thing as poor. This is something I learned when I was in India. Somebody said, how could you possibly learn that there is no such thing as poor? when you lived in India for five years. <laughs> I could come out my gate. I was explaining some, this to someone this morning. I could come out the gate in my little tiny temple. I could open the gate in the morning and six or 10 of the children would be there. And one of them would dump water on my feet and the rest of them would come over and kiss my feet. And I would give them a blessing and we would start the day playing. They were rich, they were happy, they were able to play. They might be poor, they might have rickets, they might have scoliosis, they might have curvature of the spine, they might not have enough to eat. All these things are human frailments, of course, but their light is there. When they're children, they're light. They're still playing. They're still discovering the world. The, the one thing about the, 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 the working with Dr. Ambikar's people and you know, with the Dalits and that, that whole group, the Dalit group of Dr. Ambikar's group, as well as the tribal people that I met in Tripura and all these different areas I got to go to, they have this, this light. Everybody does. It's a universal thing. Now this sutta that I was going to teach you, I'll go through parts of it, I won't do the whole thing, is a fascinating little sutta. It's number 98. And what it, what it is, is a sutta about how do we identify people in this world? 
Why do we do it? We just habitually do it. It exists in every language. It exists in every culture. It's existed historically forever. No matter where we have people going around, we can point to the animals. It actually exists among horses. It exists among the cattle. You don't want um, brown and white cows to try to exist in the same field as the black cows for the Angus cows. And white sheep don't always work out with black sheep. And chickens are a mess sometimes. You think that you're just gonna get 20 different beautiful chickens and roosters and throw them together. <laughs> you got a lot to learn about farming. It doesn't work that way. So this division thing is floating around in the minds of animals all over the place. But the thing that got me about this sutta is that I, I can't remember how we found it in the beginning, but uh, probably one of the other books, because this is in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's a sutta is Vasetti, the Vasetti Sutta. But but the thing is that the um, the the sutta is a simple lesson. The Buddha is explaining how to identify a Brahmin. Now, a Brahmin is that funny word. You know, you have the caste system and the Brahmin that way, but the Brahmin. When you're talking about the Brahmin here, you're talking about the perfect human being. You're kind of talking about the perfect human being. So the argument here in these students and everything are having a discussion and one of the students is saying to the other one, how do we identify a Brahmin? What is it that makes the person the perfect human being? What is that? And of course, then you fall into the trap of the birth of the idea of the caste system being created because kind of you see uh, if the person came from a pure group with the mother and a pure group with the father, then they're a Brahmin when they're born. But the other, the other person is saying, no, no, it's different than that. If the person, when they grow up, does all the proper ceremonies and proper celebrations and comes to the temple the proper way, that is the Brahmin. So one is saying, I'm born into it. The other is saying uh, that I, I, by works, by works is how I become a problem. Now, I'm a person was involved with a Christian church, a big one, for a long time, where we would say faith without works is dead. And I really believed that. And I have always lived this way. This is, this is true. Faith without works is dead. So somebody just talking about this, this neighborhood is in trouble. It's filthy, dirty, it's infected, it has too many ticks, the dogs are sick, the children are sick, this place is a mess, useless. A statement of what's wrong, and maybe a few ideas you're gonna to go to the coffee shop and discuss about how you could fix it, and then you're gonna go home. But who is it that cleaned up the street? Gandhi went out and he actually cleaned up the street. He demanded that they clean up the toilets. He demanded that everything get straightened out. He's actually fixed. So this is what we mean by faith without works is dead. Don't you sit down and just tell me to fix the world and just go home and say that's the end of it. Now, there's a few exceptions. You're too old. You can't work anymore and you can't move around. Then I expect you to invite 10 people over to your house and convince them to move around. There you go. There's never an excuse. There's no excuse for not doing anything. There is no excuse. This morning I sat down with Patrick. He's my personal attendant. He's learning to be a good one too. And we have a project right now. It's, a, it's kind of fun. We are working with trying to, trying to design, uh, trying to design a way for you to remember um, that when you are working with metta, loving kindness, you end hatred. And when you are working with karuna, compassion, that is the end of thoughts about cruelty towards anyone. And then if you stumble into this experience 
of uh, being happy for someone else's success. That's mudita. That's a special kind of joy. It's different than regular, just hyper energetic joy. You're feeling really happy, but in this case, it's not about you. And you can't, you're surprised that you're happy because, because someone else is, is succeeding. That's mudita. Okay, and if you're doing that, guess what happens? There are no thoughts of discontent. You cannot bring thoughts of discontent up in the mind if you are celebrating someone else's success. You try it. Don't listen to me. You try these things. The last one is upeka. When you fall into upeka has a lot of variations, a lot of small pieces that get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger as you abandon concern from the outside, as you stay in the present time only more and more. What is happening to you is you have the end of all thoughts of aversion to anything. You just don't have any aversion anymore. You don't have yet aversion means I'm angry, disgust, push away, think all that. You don't have it anymore. It doesn't happen. It can't come up because you're just balanced. And so, what is this balance? It's important to understand a little bit about upeka and just not wave it around and say, well, upeka, equanimity. Um, so, if we wave it around a little bit, what do we see? I think what we see mostly is how close you come to staying in the present time, just the present time. Now, people ask me all the time, one of the things Patrick wants me to do, I think is a good thing. We wanna talk one talk about just talking about how, if I told you all to come back next week and bring a friend and each one of you bring a friend, and when you come back, I want you to tell me, how did you use one of these? How did you use equanimity this week? How did it, how did, where did you use it? Where did you experience it? This is something you need to test, this equanimity. And what I want you to test is how, how did you apply the loving kindness, the compassion, the, the equanimity part, how did you take those three and use them in, in life daily? Because people will say, oh, you know, I'm not doing my, I said you're meditating. Well, I don't, I don't have the time and I can't find a half hour. Or I can't 30 minutes. I don't know. I said, no, I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask you that. I said, are you meditating? Well, I said, I don't have time. I said, no, but I didn't ask you that if you had time. I ask you, are you applying it when I say, are you practicing? And then they'll say, how, how do you take this? How do you put this? So he's asking the same question at 27, 26, 25 years old. They're asking the same question. How do we apply this, this equanimity? Well, let's look at how we can take it from out here. The whole idea of this big subject and get it closer together to the pinpoint. And the pinpoint would be how many times this week did you catch yourself getting tense and tight about something that was from the past in your mind going on again and again and again and again. You know, like, you know, I just finished doing a divorce or I just finished. Uh, you know, taking care of my grandmother for three months and I'm exhausted <laughs> or uh, this, uh, how, how do you um, look at this, this, uh, how did you use this? And so the first thing is how many times did you catch yourself thinking about the upsetting point? You, 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 here's how it works. The suffering is the tension and tightness and the con it is the contact, the craving, the clinging is holding onto it tight and making it tighter. That's the suffering. So if we're gonna back out of the suffering, first we have to identify it. How can I tell you to let go of it if I can't tell you what it is? 
And so it's this tight thing and we can make it a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. How? By identifying it. So it's I think that this is about me. It's mine. It's myself. You practice. What if what is happening is just a thought coming up in my mind? It's not me. It's not mine. It's not myself. It's not it's not my fault. This thought just popped up in my mind and I can't think about what I was thinking about before. It's not my fault. It just kind of um, it just kind of popped up. Do you see that? The moment that you identify that, you are identifying anatta. The anatta is this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And you're experimenting with how does that feel? If it's not me, wow, it's not my fault. I'm not to blame. I am not the one that is has to carry this load. Do you see how simple it was? You just were looking at the tightness here. And then if I let it go, oh, look at that. It's getting closer to the problem. Oh, the problem was I was thinking about something in the past and the past doesn't belong in the present. Why doesn't it belong in the present? It's not part of the present. It's part of the past. And, and the past where it was before the past back there, is empty and that energy is all used up. So if you are thinking about something that is from the past and that is what is causing the tightness, you are taking energy from the present time, not reliving the past. That's what you have to teach yourself because you think that you're reliving the past. So if you, we're trying to hold on to something all the time, trying to make something a particular way. Stop and see what it's like not to do that and notice that you were doing it only because you were always doing it before that way. Means that you were repeating the past, repeating the past, repeating the past again and again, see? Let's go in the other direction. What if it's not about the past? What if I'm sitting at work and all I can think about is what has to happen this afternoon and I don't want to go to that meeting after I'm finished work because I'm afraid of what might happen at that meeting and you know I don't know if they'll agree with me and I want to improve my working conditions but I don't know if anyone will listen to me. Now I'm obsessing over something that might happen when I'm finished work today in the future doesn't have to be next year. It can be after lunch. Okay. <laughs> pulling the Buddha, pulling the teaching, the, the only way that this teaching can survive this century, in my opinion, is to bring it home here, right now. So if you don't like the world the way it is, that's what 98 is about. This comes back to the sutta number 98. It comes back to that as we look at that sutta and how do we identify people? How do we put them in a box and identify them this way or that way? It comes from every language and we want to put them in a category. But what if we didn't? The question you need to ask yourself when you wake up in the morning is, do I like this world? Maybe you don't. Sometimes I don't. I'm sort of funny right now because I'm very excited about the world. There is a light inside of me that is shining brighter than it has ever shined. And I don't quite understand it yet, but I can tell you before you leave this life, there is a veil. You will pass through that veil from life into death, but there's no big deal here. You passed through the veil to become born into this life. You are living in this life now, and you will pass through that very, very thin, tiny veil as you leave. But before you leave, you will shine or you won't. So how can you shine as you're leaving? 
you allow yourself to shine and remember that whatever you put out is what you get back. And the best way you can turn that light on if you've never turned it on is start giving. Give the truth, give the, give the truth and share the simple parts of this teaching. The past is the past. The future is the future. We can't touch either one when we live in the present time. We are tremendously strong you, as, as a being. We are tremendously strong as a human being tremendously powerful and what happened to me the first three months of my cancer nobody would tell me anything directly right to the face you're absolutely dying well i knew that anyway <laughs> i mean i was born i'm living and i'm dying i remember the first doctor here i like i liked him very much he wasn't going to be my doctor. He was at a special clinic. He wasn't at the government the hospital. But we went there first and he sat down after the first three pictures they took. And he sat down and he was, you know, serious, and sitting there trying to be very kind across the desk from me. And he said, no, he reached over and took my hand and he said, I have to tell you something. And he said, yes, this is a very serious cancer. This is stage four and it's metastasized vastly means it's spread into your bones and into your spine and everything. And every it, it's, and I, he wasn't into hope or anything, just telling me, you know, and he says, and you are going to die. And I looked at him and I said, Okay, so, <laughs> and he was waiting for me to cry. He was waiting for me to get upset. And I, and, and he said, this is serious. You really, there's no way out of this. And I went, okay, you're gonna die. She's gonna die, the nurse, I'm gonna die. So what's new here? What do we do next? Was my attitude. That came from Bonte. He taught me that. He taught me the truth of this whole thing, of your whole experience on this earth is you are born, you live, what you do between birth and death is all that matters. And then that death at the end, if you go out with grace, you go out with giving. And if you are teaching the simple lessons, the present time is all you have. And the present time moves and changes every day. You can make it pink. You can paint it purple. You can make it blue. I like these 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 little boxes for the, these funny boxes. They decorate for clean tissues. They make all these really <laughs> colors and everything. You can learn about all the colors. You should do this. It's actually fun. Get a, a book about colors so that you know that pink makes you happy. Fill a room with pink quartz pieces of pink quartz, put them anywhere you want in the room. Nobody will fight anymore in that room. Nobody will argue. They'll stop. Don't tell them it's there. Just put it there. <laughs> it's really funny. Okay. You have purple, you have blues, you have sea color greens. All these things have energy around you. They're all part of your nature and the energy affects you. And the Buddha knew this, he knew all of this stuff. He was, he was exposed to all these practices. Even before, you know, he was exposed in his own journey, believe me, well, through different types of yoga, through different types of mind work, through different types of everything in his journey, as he was searching for things, he was exposed to the best teachers and the best things he was exposed to. But in the end, what did he do? Ah, what did he do? He uncovered the secret of going back to the control center, of letting go of what you learn on the outside about seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and I'm sorry, seeing and hearing, and smelling and uh, tasting and touching on the outside experience 
And he went one step beyond. And he declared it in the Dhammapada, the very first verse. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are they. That's where it is. The very first verse. You don't have to learn the whole Dhammapada. Just learn that one little couplet, that one couplet. Whether it's this way or that way, it all starts here. Then he went to the mind to learn how the mind works. And everything flows from that. All the anatomy, the operation of the optical system, the auditory system, the olfactory system, the oral system, the anatomy of the body, all of it is operating from, from the brain. See? So why not, he thinks, why not go to the brain and figure out what the suffering starts from there? And then is there any way to change it? And what does he come up with? What does he come up with? If you want to change the world, you change your mind. And so is the person who has cancer powerless? Ha! The first three months I was powerless. No one would give me any straight answers. Like you are going to die or you know, there are treatments that can do this, but nothing's going to save you. Okay, 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 okay. But they wouldn't give you just the skivvy. We say the skivvy. When I say give me the skivvy, it means give me not this broad story, the big picture. Bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. What's left? Light. Your heart your mind, the core of the teaching is left. So how did he tell you to use it? There's not just one sutta about right effort. There's hundreds of teachings of right effort, the four steps of right effort, and the four steps of right striving. And what is right striving? Right striving is the signal to you that right effort can become right striving, automatic right effort. It becomes automatic. How do you make something come automatic, Sister Kama? Well, did you ever learn to ride a bike? <laughs> did you learn to ride a bike? Can you remember how hard it was when you first learned to ride a bike? And your father was there saying, keep paddling, don't stop. <laughs> you know? Don't stop. Keep pedaling. Keep going. Okay, let's let's listen to this sutta a little bit. Let's listen to this now. The point I get out of the sutta is we're going through this sutta, okay? Is that humankind must understand at this time. There is no reason at all that it is viable to have a war on this earth at all. There is nothing, no reason. If we eliminate every reason that marks a man or woman as to who or what they are, there is nothing left except a remarkable planet that can support 10 times the life that is here now. We don't have to cut down the population. We need to cut down the language. We need to cut down, tear away what it is we are labeling people with. What it is we are, that part, you listen to it as we go through this. So it's on page 798, if you're gonna follow in the book. It's the Vasetti Sutta. And thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Ichina, Ichinanagala. I love the place. Ichinanagala is in the woods near Ichikanawala. <laughs> They're trying to make me say Ichikanawala a <laughs> hundred times. On the occasion, there was a number of well-known, well-to-do Brahmins. So these Brahmins are 
when they said the higher uh, group of people, they're just talking about the scholars, the ones that are asking questions constantly, the ones that are searching. These are the Brahmins we're talking about. They're staying there. And these are the most famous ones. And if you're listening to me teach the suttas, or you're listening to one of our teachers teaching the suttas, you have already heard some of these names. You already know about them. The Brahmin Chanki, we know about him from 95. The Brahmin Turaku, there's another lesson that teaches him. Poka Rasati, we heard of him. Janasoni, there was a discussion with the Buddha with Janasoni. Brahmin Todia, do you remember Todia? He was in, he was, I think he's in the Chanki Sutta. He was the young monk that thought he knew everything. He was 16 years old and they didn't want to let him speak, but the other Brahmins, they respected him. And so they wanted the Buddha to answer his questions. That's how come you got the lesson in the Chanki Sutta because of Todia. And then Vasetti and Bharadvaja are the two monks that are, they're the two, two Brahmins that are walking around, and they're the ones that started this whole thing, this whole sutta. They're the ones that had this discussion, how is one a Brahmin? So this becomes the question, how is one a Brahmin? And the one says, when you're well-born on both sides, you're pure maternal and paternal descent for seven generations long. There's good people in your family that are doing good things. Unassailable and un impeccable. It means no nobody can contradict the purity of your birth and your family background. Then you are Brahmin, that's how come. And the other one says, when you are virtuous and fulfill the observances and the celebrations at the temple, that's how you become a Brahmin. That's these are the two positions. And so they go away to the Buddha and they go to find him. He's nearby. And uh, then they ask him, they tell him the problem. And he says, OK, they, they present it to him this way. We're both acknowledging uh, to possess the knowledge that we claim of the triple Veda. Now, this is the Vedas, the Upanishads. I don't remember all of them, but there's a whole set of books that the Brahmins study. And these are the oldest books in India that they preserve. And they, they, they are still today in New York. I, I met a bunch of teenagers who are studying this tradition with these books, and they're doing it in the same way that the Buddha is describing it. And I got to interview those kids and they, they're not allowed to ask questions. They just come in and they memorize these books and recite them back. And they're not allowed to ask any questions. That's not part of the training. It's fascinating. And so it's happening the same way today as it was in the time of the Buddha. We have attained full mastery, they say. And the Vedic experts teach we understand the philology and the grammar. And this is like the presentation. Philology is the presentation and how you explain something clearly. And the grammar is a specific kind of grammar. So you, you could think of it as if I said to Jay, let's go study Shakespeare. If you went to study Shakespeare in the beginning, you would go, oh my gosh, Sister Kama, what are they talking about? <laughs> you know, because Shakespearean language is like a different thing to listen to. The way we talk about it, it's not the same as other literature. And it's difficult for a while to get used to it. Well, that's what this is talking about, philology and grammar. A dispute has arisen between us, Gotama, concerning the question of birth and class. One of them says that you are a Brahmin by birth and the other says a Brahmin by action. What should we do? How should we, we should believe this? And none of us convince the other one or make him see a point of view. They like to fight a lot. These groups, they, they sort of, this was the birth of, in the Vajrayana tradition, some of, of Buddhism, some places they go out every day, two hours, like Jay and I would go out and you would sit opposite me and your position would fight against my position for one hour. And then I would have to talk to you for one hour and try to make you agree to my position and nobody ever wins. <laughs> and that's what this, this, is, this is talking about. Neither one could convince the other and make him see the point of view. So we're coming to ask you because since you're the Buddha, we're gonna ask you. 
So the people turn with their palms upraised. Now, now what goes on here is they're just praising him because we come to you because people are listening to you and you seem to understand everything. We're at section six um, and one Brahmin about, about all this. And then the Buddha says, okay, listen, I will teach you in order who these people really are. This is how the sutta starts. And the blessed one starts, there are generic divisions of living beings. And many of these kinds of birth are occurring on the planet. Now, remember, I don't know if you remember, but because I haven't been teaching for a while, but I told you one of the most interesting things for me was in, in, in studying about the Buddha, people often ask me, but did he tell us everything? They'll come to you and they'll say, but did he really explain everything? And I'll say, yeah, he did. I mean, I have not found yet today in 22 years, any topic that if I go to a really good monk who studies this stuff, he's going to say the Buddha never said anything about that. <laughs> the Buddha said, something about everything it seems like and so when you're going through this you listen carefully because he has examined the subject so completely that he has plenty to say about it it's amazing all right so first of all he starts out describing life on the entire planet he's not going to just explain to you what it is for one human being to be a Brahmin and one. Now he's gonna to try to get you to understand the whole problem on earth of labeling people. What is the big problem? Well, first he says there's the grass and the trees <laughs> and they lack self-awareness and the birth is a dis their birth is a distinctive mark. When they say this phrase, the way they're born is a distinctive mark telling you who they are and how they operate. And so they have many kinds of birth. Then he says, next comes the moths and the butterflies. And then you go to the ants and the termites and they are born. And if you, I lived in the forest a lot, all right. And, and spent days in the forest working and stopping and examining things. And each kind of ant has a mark and a design on what they look like. And this, so going through the ants and the termites, each of them have a birth, a distinctive mark on them. There's a solitary ant, for instance, that has a, is a solitary ant and he has a velvet, they call him a velvet ant and he's orange, bright orange, red. You might have them in Australia and they, they're solitary. They don't have an ant hill to live with. They live alone. I don't, know the breeding of this whole thing but they live alone and um one bite can kill a baby cow it's that serious and they're about half the size of my baby finger and i found one one time and followed it for half an hour could never find out where it lived could never figure it out but it um doesn't you know these are the marks okay the next one are the quadrupeds both those are four legged uh, bugs and then you, number 11 it tells there are those with the belly the ones that move around life that moves around on its belly and uh, the bellies are their feet and they have long backed class of snakes that move around everything moves around on a belly there's no feet he's saying that's another form of birth and then a water dwelling fish in the pasture can be born in puddles. It doesn't have to be in a stream. And then when the rain comes, it washes the, the fish from the pasture into the stream. I've seen that. And then they live in the stream and go to the lake and get bigger. Another one is the birds that wing their way. They range through the open skies and they live only in the sky or land in the tree to sleep. And the next one at 14 are the births of the differences, the birthmark, distinctive marks. With humans, it is no different with their birth. So at 14, he starts to explain the human being now. Now he's going to start to identify human beings. There, 
with human beings, there are no differences of their birth. This is the first thing he says, no differences. Maybe in the style of birthing a baby with the nurses treating you, you know, the, the delivery nurses handling things, you would do it different ways. Like a Laboye baby would be born under the water and brought out, okay? Or um, there's many different tribal traditions of birthing babies, but the fact is human beings are born the same way. You're not gonna get out of this. So there's no difference in the hairs on your head, nor in the ears, nor in the eyes, nor in the mouth or the nose of any human being or on the lips or on their brows, the way the top of your head is. There's no difference in your shoulders or your neck, not in your belly or your back. There's no difference in your buttocks, you know, buttocks and, um, or your breast, your breastbone, it's the same. And there's no difference in the genitals and the ways that the human beings mate. There is nothing different in the hands nor in the feet, nothing different in the fingers or the nails, or in the knees or in the thighs, not in the color of the person's skin or in the voice, the way they speak. In human bodies, in themselves, nothing is distinctive can be found. The distinction among human beings is purely a verbal designation. Remember that. It is purely an invented verbal designation. This is what is important. Okay. Then you have, who makes his living among men? We can identify a person in that way. By agriculture, you should know if he is carrying the, the, the agriculture, that he is called a farmer and living among men with a craft that's being carried, you would say he is a craftsman or merchandise to sell, you would say he is the merchant or you might say his living among men by serving others he is called the servant, the, the person who carries the extra stuff in the caravan to make sure it all works. And who makes his living among men? By stealing. Now we go to the thief. That one is the robber. And then the one who makes his living among men by archery, you should know that he is called the soldier. And he who makes a living among men by a priestly craft, you should know that he is called the chaplain. And whoever governs among the men, the town, the realm, the country, that person is called a ruler. Now he goes to another section and he declares to Vasetti, I call him not a Brahmin. I do not call the, the Brahmin because of his origin or his lineage. I do not call them the Brahmin. If impediments will still lurk in him. What's an impediment? An impediment is suffering. A under, lack of understanding how suffering works is an impediment, a blockage. He is just one who says, sir, they are just someone who says, sir, to me, who is unimpeded and he clings no more. The person who is free from suffering simply says, sir, to me and talks to me about the suffering, but does not over speak about the suffering or go on and on and on through the suffering, but leaves the suffering in the past and learns to stay in the present. This is what you're learning. You're being trained. So. Who has cut off all the fetters? So if we were to go back from here in 28 and go to the fetters, the 10 fetters, we could branch out from there and put a little line and say, okay, now let's go back in our lessons about the fetters and look at the fetters and, and is no more by anguish shaken by these fetters. Lust and greed, hatred and aversion, 
all the different fetters that are tied up with keeping you from being freeing your mind. If you're caught there, who have overcome all those ties and you're not, you're detached from them. If you are detached from those ties and understand you can leave it in the past and not worry about it in the future and stay in the present time, then I can call you a Brahmin. You are on a path to being a Brahmin. Who has cut each strap and thong, the reins and the bridle band as well. You are setting the horse free. The horse has the strap and the thong is tied, strapped to him. You're trying to control everything. But the one whose crossbar is lifted, the crossbar is a bar you carry on your shoulder to carry the weight of something. The awakened one, that person I will call a Brahmin. You are on a path to the Brahmin. You understand? Who endures without a trace of hate? Oh, look what's happening now. You are in beginning to learn to endure without a trace of hatred. Loving kindness. You are giving up abuse and violence and bondage. There is your compassion. With strength and patience, well arrayed. That person is on the road to being the Brahmin. That one. This is what he's saying. Who does not flare up with anger? is dutiful, virtuous, and humble, the best you can, and subdued, bearing his final body to the end. This is the one I call the Brahmin. It's like, relax, you were born, relax, you live, relax, you die. You come through again, okay, you have a lot of training. You come through again, you're gonna have an easier way and a, a lot more to share. And the training keeps going life to life. If that's the deal for you, then you're just right where you should be. Who like the rain on lotus leaves. This is beautiful. Or the mustard seed on the point of an awl. Do you know what that means? That's kind of tough to explain. Um, an awl is a little piece of metal with a point on the end of it and you're trying to make silver jewelry, and you're trying to you know, work with the point of an oil is very sharp. And a mustard seed is the smallest seed in the world. They talk about in spiritual teachings, the mustard seed is a tiny, tiny, tiny seed, and it's balancing on the point of the oil. Clings not at all to sensual pleasures. It's beautiful to see the balance of the seed on the point of the all but you don't cling to this pleasure of seeing that you simply let it go by you are learning to live by living with the river with the flow of the river to the ocean that's the way you should see this whole thing you are learning to float with the currents with the full understanding of this whole thing who knows right here within himself the destruction of all suffering with your burden is lowered and detached. That means that you are listening to the teaching. You are taking it home. You are practicing it. That one is the one I will call the Brahmin. And who with deep understanding, wise, can tell the path from the not path can see the person who is still caught, you see, has attained the goal supreme, the clear understanding. It doesn't mean the super mundane Nibbana and the rest of it. It doesn't have to be that far, but you see the way the other person is caught and you can show the person the simple ways of letting go of the way they're caught by saying, practice living in the present for a day. Laugh about those things that keep coming up in the past. This is your power. This is, this is your strength. This is where you are not helpless. This is where you have something to give that you don't think you have to give. You keep obsessing on yourself and everything, but you forget that you have this, that you can share in simple ways to the taxi driver who is frustrated 
and angry at the last person that got in his taxi cab, <laughs> you can help him. You can help the person who is so upset everything isn't working and saying, yes, but the next one might work. Let's see what we can do and work in the present time and let go of what just happened and stay here and move toward the next. You see what you're doing? You're teaching every time you do that. Then he says, aloof from all householders and those gone are and those gone into homelessness. That's the person who has given up anything having to do with householders, but you don't have to do that. You go into the homelessness. This is the next level talking about the person who finally leaves the home, the home situation and just wants to see how empty they can get. And so they go into homelessness to us uh, to try to do that. And we do this by and when we are householders, we do this with our retreats. That's what they're for, for us to help you stay on track for 10 days and see what it's really like to sit in the present time as much and strongly as possible for 10 straight days in everything you do. Not just when you're in the meditation formally, in everything you do. Who wanders without a home or a wish, who's just watching the present time. That's 35. Who has laid down the rod against all beings, frail or bold? That means you're not going to pick up anything and go against anybody who does not kill or have them killed. Now we're talking the precepts from 36. It starts talking about the precepts. Who is unopposed among opponents, peaceful among those that are given to violence. You can be amidst a whole lot of violence, but remain totally and completely at peace. And when you do that in the present time mind, you will think of a way of just simply shining the power of the loving kindness and compassion in the direction. That's why we're teaching you the directions. You're learning to target a group of people sent shining like a light bulb. I like this because the lights on my face <laughs> shining, you know, shining outward to the people around me. You see, and that calms them down. I have sent uh as strong as I could loving kindness out into a parking lot where people were trying to have a knife fight. And suddenly they stop, but they don't know where it's coming from because I'm in a building one story up and I'm watching a driveway and I'm sending it to that. And then and they stop and they start looking around and then they all break up and they walk away. How did that happen? I don't know, except the natural energy of the earth is flowing through the person if you're not blocking it with fear and anger and all of the negative things. You're opening yourself. Who is, who is unopposed among opponents? They don't oppose you. I have a lot of opponents, but they don't oppose me. <laughs> You're laughing about it the other day. And I said, I don't have these. And they said, you don't. I said, yes, I do. But they don't come face to face with me. They don't actually bring up whatever it is they oppose. And it's all, it's just all floating there. It doesn't matter. Who does not cling among those who cling? So you don't cling to problems that come up and are happening. Okay, next page, 38. Who has dropped all lust and hate? Now you're getting back to the Brahma Viharas. Dropped all the lust and hate is from the loving kindness. Dropped conceit and attempt, uh, contempt, and that one is from the um, compassion and a, aversion, letting go of, of, I'm sorry, it's, it's practicing the compassion and the conceit and contempt falls away. Who utters speech from, free from harshness as much as possible full of meaning 
ever truthful. That's great. Do it as naturally as possible. Don't get preachy. Just come down to earth and be with people naturally. You don't have to be up here to teach this stuff at all. That's one of the downfalls, I think, in Buddhism is the two superiority thing of I can't sit here with my hands folded with you guys and get real formal. I do sometimes, you know, I do. But <laughs> maybe when I ring the bell. <laughs> but I just am part of life. This whole thing is part of life for me. It's what permeates through my existence in life. And that's the way I feel the Buddhism should be. Who in the world will never take what is not given long or short? So that's your precept again. Who has no more inner yearnings regarding the world and the next? You give up your frustrations. This is a good one for the cancer. Your frustrations of what you haven't done here. Stop the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair about what you didn't do here. It's nonsense. You're not going to do it. The truth, the thing about cancer is you're talking about the truth, you know, the truth. And when I was teaching, uh, I was teaching someone the other day, I said, that it's this whole thing about the truth. And we have this um, in our uh, booklet for our retreat, okay, we, we printed this whole section about the instructions. And if you go back to the instructions for, for the loving kindness, okay, you're going to find, I'm pretty sure, I don't hope I did it the right place. You're gonna find the thing that Bonte talks about the truth. And this thing about the truth is super, super, super important. It comes in the meta instructions. And there's a section, if you have the booklet, it's page 26, but if you don't, it reads like this. And I think you've heard me say it before many times. I'm sorry, I'm in the dark. This light is not good here. Okay, there you go. You may notice there's still a tight mental fist that is wrapped around the sensation that is the, this is coming from the instructions for the metta. There's a mental fist of tension that is wrapped around the sensation because you really don't like the sensation that's there and you really want it to go away. But the truth is that when a sensation is there, that is the truth. See, this is what I want you to always remember. The truth is when a sensation is there, that's the truth. And it's okay for the sensation to be there. It has to be okay because it's there. And anytime you fight with the truth, anytime you try to control the truth, anytime you try to take the truth to be anything other than it is, that is the cause of the suffering. Yeah? You allow the sensation to be there. You make it okay for it to be there. You relax it, you gently come back to the feeling of being happy and making a wish for your own happiness. And then when you're doing this meditation, you remember all the time, it's a smiling meditation. And you want to put the smile in your mind. And even though your eyes are closed, you put the little smile into your eyes, okay? And you put the smile on your lips, a little one, and a smile in your heart. Whenever you notice that you're not smiling, you start again because that smile loosens up your mind, sharpens your awareness, and makes you in tune with the teaching just like that. Very quickly. Okay, the next one. Here we go. Who has more indulgences, no more no more indulgences. You're not thinking, this is number 42, not thinking about indulgences, uh, what you should do, what you could do, all that stuff. No more perplexity since you know who has gained a firm footing in the deathless. You That means 
gained a firm footing in the deathless means it is the death of concern. Do you understand? If you're over-concerned with something, you're perplexed by it, you are confused by it, blocked by it, all this stuff that is your perplexity. But now you know you've gained a firm footing, a firm understanding in the deathless, in the deathless of what? The death of this concern, and you see it clearly. Who has transcended all ties here of both merit and evil deed? So you're not obsessing on the good things you've done or the bad things at this point. You're just purely there in the present time. And who pure as the spotless moon is clear and limpid in whom delight and being have been destroyed. So it's not that you're giving up delight. You shouldn't lament that. That's not what this means. It just means any tension of, of wanting or pushing away is just gone. That's all this means. Who has passed beyond the swamp the mire, the samsara, all the delusion passed away from Atta, the delusion, who has crossed to the further shore and is unperturbed and un unperplexed. Now it gets to be a little bit repetitive. Attain Nibbana through no clinging. That's where you're going. You are, you are going to float through this place where you stop, you turn back on, it sharpens up everything, and then you get to look again. This happens many times to us in our period of training, not just once, but it, it happens and it grows stronger and stronger naturally, but we don't push, we don't want it. If you want it, you can't have it. Who has abandoned the sensual pleasures and wanders here in homelessness if they wish, and who has abandoned craving and wanders in the homelessness? They're just restating that again. The balance, who leaves behind all human bonds, casts off the bonds of heaven. You're not overly concerned about heaven where you think you're going to go or anything like that, or, or you're just detached from all bonds everywhere. That's what he's saying all bonds everywhere, who leaves behind delight and leaves behind the discontent, who is cool and acquisitionless. Acquisition means you spend time trying to get things, you spend time trying to take hold of things and hold on to things. You are cool and acquisitionless. So I'm giving you these definitions of words for a meaning. I know that you need to break them down so that you can see each piece. Who knows how beings pass away? You understand how these beings pass away. That's what this is saying. To reappear in many a mode, unclutching, you are sublime and awake. Awake is this big word, the awake. Whose destination is unknown to gods, to spirits, to men, an arahant with tights destroyed. He's the one that I am calling the total Brahmin. This is where he says at 51, that is the one I am calling the Brahmin, the one who is complete. Is his monks that went through all the different attainments, all the different fruitions, and they all then get to this eventually place. They don't all get there, but they get there in their passage of life. And if they come back in other lifetimes and other places and other forms, this is floating underneath inside them, coming up and helping them continue their journey until it's just over. Who has no impediments? They have no impediments at all. No blockages at all, not before, not behind, not in the middle. They are unimpeded and they cling no more. So he's stretching it there. Then he goes, the herd leader, perfected hero, the great seer whose victory is won. He's unperturbed. He's cleansed and awakened. That's what he is. He's the one I call the Brahmin. And for name and clan, that can be assigned. But they are mere designations of the world. Now he goes back to the summary. He originating 
in conventions. They're assigned here and there. But for those who do not know this fact, wrong views have long underlain their hearts. Not knowing this, they declare to us, this one is a Brahmin, that one is a Brahmin by birth. Or they say, one is not a Brahmin by birth, one is a Brahmin by action. They fight over this. They fight over these two things. And this is nonsense, he's saying, because men are simply farmers by their acts, craftsmen too, they're merchants by their acts, they're servants and robbers and soldiers and chaplains and rulers. And so this is truly wise. You seeing action as it really is. You're seers of dependent origination. This is what you are becoming when you practice and you and you listen carefully to us when we explain this to you correctly. We're just teaching you that you are the seers of human cognition. The person who realizes the neuroplasticity is real. You're skilled in your actions and you are skilled in the results. Your action makes the world go round. Your action makes this generation turn. Living beings are bound by their actions. Living beings are bound by uh, the chariot wheel, by the linchpin, the wheel, the, the wheel. It means the chariot wheel is bound to the linchpin is the pin in the middle of the wheel. And the, the chariot is hooked to the wheel. But you steer the chariot. You are not powerless. Asceticism, the holy life, self-control and inner training. This is one becomes the Brahman. In this supreme Brahmanhood, that is how it lies. That is how it is. One possessing the triple knowledge, peaceful with being, all of this destroyed. You should know him. You should know him, Vasati. He is as Brahma is and Saka, who understands these things. So who was Brahma? Who was Saka? So Brahma was the highest. And we were saying the other day, uh, Buddhism is not religion in the sense of other religions. He's saying it, many people I teach, I do believe in God. And so if they believe in God, how do they do that? I believe in something, somewhere, some head, some point of starting. That's good. That's a good start. And the highest in India is Brahma and Saka. That kingdom, Saka, I get Saka Brahma. I don't know enough about this, to be honest. But to be as Brahma as Saka is to let go. And Brahma and Saka studied with the Buddha. They went to him to have him clarify to them how. And they praised him for his understanding. There should be no conflict between Brahma, Saka, and the existence of a man who became a Buddha. No, no problem. And he's just saying the purity of Brahma and the purity of Saka is what I seek. The purity and that same thing and any rules that go outside of the uh, precepts, such as killing animals and sacrifice and stuff like that, we can eliminate all of that. But this is real. This is real. So coming back to me talking to you all about this, what happened with these guys, of course, at the end, magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent from today, Master Gotama remembers us as lay followers, and we shall be gone to him with refuge for life. They've decided to come over and look at this more clearly and look at this in a way where there is no way to legitimately take to any judicial branch of a country or world council or anything and say there is a reason to have a war. 
we all have a purpose and we all have a gift and we all have light and we need to be concentrating on that. If we continue to invent ways, for instance, to help people get over pain by go sit with the pain and stay with the pain until it goes away and examine the negative aspects of pain and how it can hurt you and how it's dark and everything like that, you are feeding your mind. And as you do that, that's how you will sleep that night. It won't be easy. When you wake up and the pain comes back, you will do it again and again and again. Because why? Because the pain is waiting for you to think about it. But you don't need to think about it. Why would you fight with the truth? It's there. It's there at night. It comes at one o'clock. So you wake up and say, hello, pain. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> okay, I need to adjust the position I sleep in. This is the pain. And then I need to start again with step by step. So what happened to me in the first three months? Negativity, cut and dry information, improper direction as far as pain management was concerned as far as uh, the, the way I should look at it. And I knew enough to not do that. I knew enough about the truth. So what's happened in the, in after three weeks, I went into emergency room. I'm sorry, after three, after three months of diagnostics, I got on to the treatment plan and two months into the treatment plan, I still didn't have answers. You see, and then the last month, I started to get very direct answers of managing your pain. Your brain will come back. You'll be able to see things more clearly. You will be able to process and use your brain, which is happening. So I'll finish just by telling you what happened when I was at the last review for the, for the drugs and talking to the oncologists. And I went in the office for my turn. I had been sitting in the hallway and our hallway, we meet the same day each month to check with the oncologist. And we start another, another, tr another month's process of using the drugs. And they have to go through tests and everything each month to check to see if you're. So it was my turn and I went in. And before I went in to talk to them, there was a woman who was sitting in the hallway. And there's usually about 30 or 40 of us in this hallway, all jammed together, waiting for the same sad news of we get to keep going and the pain is still there and the rest of it. And sometimes it's a little worse than news, but but most of the time it's all very down uh, information and yeah, your, your drugs are coming, but they look very sad when you go in the office. They're very, very solemn and quiet and there's no pink room, there's no bright colors. It's all very not that way. It's not uplifting at all. And um, so when I went in, it was normal, but I usually go in and start laughing and start telling them, uh, well, how things are going and gradually they're smiling and I'm smiling. And when I came out of the room, just before I went in the room, actually, the husband of this woman said to me, could you please talk to my wife before you leave? I don't know this man, you know, he's, I thought Polish, but he's speaking English. He knows enough English. And so he said, please, can you speak to her? Because she's so down. She wants to understand. Why are you shining? And I looked at her and I said, I'm shining. I didn't think I was shining. Why are you shining? He wants to, she, she needs to know. Why aren't you not like the rest of these people in the hallway? And I didn't have time to say much. I had to go in for my turn. But when I, before I went in, I said, because, because I made a decision. So I left her that way. Then I came out 
then someone else went in and I had a chance to talk to her for just a minute. She said, what did you mean you made a decision? And I said, well, I made a decision that I don't have to be powerless in this situation. I felt all these months, everything was happening to me. And because when you believe everything is happening to you, you feel like the rain of, of Mount Vesuvius' explosion is coming down on top of you. You know, the volcano's going off and you're, you're gonna be crushed. Everything is happening to you. And no one's giving you any answers because there are no answers because sometimes the truth, it doesn't have an answer, but some of the truth is there. And so what is the truth? You have to back up and say, what is the truth? This truth is this. The truth is this is real. The truth is this is a cancer. The truth is here now. We cannot fight with the truth. We cannot change it. So what can we do? We have a basic decision. We can accept the truth and we can smile with the truth or we can and laugh at the truth is here. Start to laugh at the truth is here. It tricked you. It's here. But it's the truth. And we cannot change the truth. We have to see the truth. But the bottom line here is we can laugh or cry. That is one of the earliest lessons I ever learned before Buddhism. I was working with Kashmir Shaivism a little bit. And Siddha Yoga taught me in the very first lesson I ever learned, there's only two choices in this life. You can laugh at it or you can cry. And you look at what it does to your body. If you cry and fight with the truth and you will get exhausted and you will suffer. But if you laugh at it and you flow with it and you accept it and understand it's like the river, like the river coming and, it, and it's like the river moving, the, the balance of it, the flow of the river, okay, is happening. Well, then you learn to move with the river, but you can't turn the river off. You're in the river and you're moving towards the ocean. And when you're boating, you have to go with the flow. So you learn to move and glide with this and you take and learn the truths of this. And you know, I said to her, your husband really wants to help you. And he was there. I do, I do. But he feels helpless because he can't take this truth away. He cannot change this truth. This truth is here now. And when it's there, to fight with the truth, to try to make it something else that is different, is the certain way for you to end up suffering. So. That's what you need to do, you need to shine. And you have enough, we learn enough in this class. That's why I did this class this way. We learn enough in this class, probably longer than we should have, but <laughs> we learn enough in this class to be able to share little pieces with people that can change their lives. I know May has done it with people. I know Jay's told me he's done it with people. I know Roe, he's done it with people. I've done it with people. Simple things, one day at a time, in the present time and laughing at the past, trying to bite you from behind and giggling at the future because you know it's not here yet and you don't know what the future is gonna be. So take a hold of this present time and you just stay with that. And you watch what happens when you smile. You keep smiling because it's honestly, did I plan on this? Did I plan to come to Poland to do this? No, I came here on a business agreement to help TWIM spread out and help people in Europe. I didn't come planning on this at all. And here I am, so you have to laugh at it and you have to share it. And every time you do that, you remember. This is your merit. You are sharing merit. You are living Buddhism. You are embracing it. You are putting it into your life. And every time you do it, 
you're juicing up. We're going to talk about what happens, how you, next time I have this article someone gave me about, um, you know, how to live longer. And I'm okay, I can, let's look at that. How do we change our brain DNA so that we can live longer? And you know what the secret is? I'm going to tell you next time. i tell you next time what the secret is. There's been studies done on this, and this is really fun. And it gets right fit in your Buddhism, right like that. So let's fold our hands. You know, I'm not going to open this to questions. I think it's been pretty long here. So I'm not going to open a question. Next time when you come, I want you to bring a friend. I want you to bring someone who needs to sh just learn how to talk about, uh, you know, just be able to say, I did this, I shared it. It was little present time life is not a bad thing. It's light, it's happy. And sure, you have another thought come up and then you laugh at that, say, go away, I'm gonna stay in the present life, <laughs> okay? And share with everyone, please. And that's how you shine your light, okay? Let's give our, hold our hands. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all beef and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas and mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Blessings, everyone. Have a really, really, really great week and keep smiling. Thank you, Sister Kima. Thank you. Be well. <laughs> You're muted. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> everyone. Be well and be happy. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>